you know, I am not an internet rat, okay? We used to call the... Uh, I worked at uh, Skate World down the road here. <laughs> yeah, I worked at Skate World down the road here, and I, I was not equipped for the job. I'll tell you some stories there. Uh, when, when I got hired, there was a skate test, and I didn't even put on the skates. I told my manager, Christine, I said, Christine, I, I'm not here to skate around the rink. That's, if you want me to protect kids, you're going to keep me off the skates. <laughs> so I worked in the, uh, the uh, I don't, it's not called the skate dispensary, but it's like the place where you, you know, trade your shoes for the skates and boy, uh, you would see a lot of the same kids, and they would call themselves rink rats. That's what they called themselves, and it was so funny. If you've ever seen Jurassic Park and how the velociraptors move up and down, that's how the kids look when they're out there. Like They're just bobbing back and forth, and it's like they're, that's all that they do for three or four hours of a whole session. And I remember going there and, and just being a part of it, and I did DJing for a little bit, and, and then they started putting me on the floor as a floor guard because... They didn't have anybody else, and I'm already six foot one without skates, so add skates, I'm, I'm pushing six foot three, and you could see me take a tumble from a mile away. If a kid was, if a kid had fallen and hurt himself, I could not stop to help him. I'd have to circle him, circle him slowly, and then fall, you know, gracefully and say, are you all right? <laughs> so, but uh, I'm not an internet rink rat. I don't spend a ton of time on the internet or on videos. But this past weekend, I got an email, and it was about a critique made about Dr. Arnold. And I don't stand for Dr. Arnold. I stand for the clarity of the gospel, and the gospel was under attack. And there's only one other Dr. Ralph Yankee Arnold exposed video on YouTube, and it was shot down because people could see this gentleman, although he was trying to do his best to defend the gospel, was taking scripture out of context. And if you read the comments, people said, hey, you need to delete this video or you need to rethink this. Uh, what is being taught by this man you're accusing is lining up with the Bible contextually. And what you're teaching is, you know, it's, it's called proof texting, where here's an example of proof texting. Calvinism says you have to preserve, uh, uh, persevere until the end or you won't be saved. And then they use Matthew 24, that one verse, to proof it. The problem with that is it does not align with the context in which Jesus is talking. I mean, there's verses before and after it. And so proof texting, if we're not careful, we can end up proof texting by using verses that just may use the word grace or just use the word salvation as a proof. And it's actually not contextually talking about that. You have to be careful. You have to be able to understand the whole counsel of God uh, in order to build Bible doctrines. But there is a video that was made, and it, this was the claim. It was a message that Dr. Arnold had preached in, um, I can't remember where it was, but the, uh, it's Pastor Jim Musarino. And he was preaching a message, Yankee was, to the audience, not the people there, but to the audience in general. It was to Christians that are excusing their lack of service on grace. They say things like this, and we'll get into some of these phrases. They say, well, all my work was done in Christ, so therefore I don't have to do anything. And you actually burdened me. You're such a legalist when you tell me to soul win, when you tell me to go to church when you tell me to read my Bible. Now, on the surface, we look at this and we go, this doesn't make any sense. But there's been such a twisting of Scripture that it makes sense to a lot of people. And there are some great YouTube uh, preachers out there. They make videos in their cars and they make videos uh, out on the street, whatever it may be, and they lead people to Christ. But then they get into this doctrine, and that's the big word that's up here. It's called antinomianism. And we're going to go into the definition of it that's a big word, like you and I in plain speak would say salvation, okay? But the big word is soteriology, okay? End times and the study of end times. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word because I always get it wrong. But you can see that there's larger words that, that mean basic things. And we're going to look into the definition of that. But here's what I want you to understand. And yes, I am going to set the expectation before we get into this because it's important. You and I are saved by grace, we're kept by grace, and we will have the ultimate sanctification in heaven one day because of grace, okay? There's no part of our salvation that is kept, maintained, or completed by our works. However, works for the believer are an essential part of growth. 
We had six lilies up here on Sunday morning, and we bought them from Publix two days before. We watered them, and when we came in on Sunday morning, they were bright, they were happy, the petals were out, the buds that were going to bloom on Friday had bloomed beautiful. When we shut down the church on Sunday night, and we did not water them for two days, when we came back into the auditorium, they looked like they were dead. And in fact, they were. Petals had fallen off. The soil was hard to the touch. If you were to push your finger down in there a little bit, you may get to some moisture, but not enough to sustain the growth of the plant. And they had been in darkness, and the temperature is 77 degrees in here. They were not in an environment which was conducive to their growth. Okay, pay attention to me now. It is the same thing with the Christian. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're a child of God, period. Okay? That will never change. Unlike the illustration where that flower can fade away and turn into nothing, you, as a child of God, you're a part of something eternal now, and that's how you'll always be. However, if you shut the lights off in your life, If you starve yourself of any nourishment from the sun, not S-U-N-S-O-N, and you look to yourself to be the sustainer of your own growth, you are going to be ineffective. You're not going to grow. And there will be other Christians who will outgrow you and will be a natural rebuke to you because they are disciplined. They are taking the law and the commandments, not the Old Testament law, But they're taking the instructions from the Word of God and they are applying it to their lives and they're growing faster than the person who does not apply those things to their lives will grow. It's just natural. So here's what happens. The person that is stunted in growth is bitter and angry and doesn't want to face the truth that they are their own problem. (laughs) And so they will take portions of Scripture... And they will act like they work at Auntie Anne's down here at Citrus Park Mall and make you a new pretzel of the Scripture and say, no, no, see, all my work is done in Christ. You can't tell me what I'm supposed to do and what I am not supposed to do. Don't burden me like that. Well, don't don't say I'm burdening you. Look at Jesus. (laughs) Look at God who gives you rules and, and, and requirements and things to mark and avoid and be careful of. So this kind of doctrine, antinomianism, as we'll get into the definition in a minute, was posted on a YouTube channel. And they took a transcript of Dr. Arnold's message called Power from the Throne of Grace, in which Yankee was talking to to, to an audience of Christians, and he's saying specifically, Christians, our bodies are to be a living sacrifice for the Lord. Stop using I'm living by faith as an excuse to do nothing. Get busy doing something. I think one of the greatest tests of a growing Christian is how well do you know the Word of God to the point you can explain it to someone who does not know it? How willing are you to get the gospel message out? Because that's a matter of life and death. And this individual was going into some things that Yankee was saying. He's speaking very strongly. I'm, I'm sure we've all heard Dr. Arnold's teaching. He gets right to the nerve, and he'll step on some toes if he needs to. He's getting right to this problem, and all of the comments are missing this original lady's uh, point, which is he's a legalist by saying, if you're not going to church, if you're not praying, if you're not in your Bible, if you're not trying to win souls, you're not growing. And people were missing that point and saying that Yankee's now a false teacher. Well, this did not just stay in one little area. This affected over just two days This reached the ministry up there in St. Cloud, Minnesota. It reached the ministry there in Northside. It reached our ministry. Michael Brown was the one who showed me. And I commonly, like I said, am not uh, sulking around on the internet, you know, writing huge comments and stuff. But I wrote a comment to address this. And guess what? I knew it was going to happen because we've hid people on our channel before too. My comment got hidden. Uh, Now she's in Australia, so I posted it in the middle of the morning on my time because I knew she'd be sleepy sleepy and we could at least have that post up for a a, a little bit of time before it was taken away but my post was taken down Michael Brown put a comment up and that remained up and a couple other people that I know commented and they all got deleted and the sad thing is there are over four 
no, excuse me, only t- over 200 comments of people saying that Yankee now teaches a false gospel. They're missing the whole point of that video. And ultimately, it's a misunderstanding of how important works are for the believer. Okay? We are not put under the Old Testament law, but we are put under instructions, commandments that we are supposed to keep in order for us to grow. Okay? Next time you see a little baby, you will see the product of somebody feeding and caring for that child. When they get to the point they can feed and care for themselves, that's a requirement that they have to do to continue living. You understand? If we all went on a hunger strike, how long would it last until we're dead? You're going to stop growing at some point if you're not feeding that body. If you're not feeding the Spirit, at some point you're just going to reach a point where you're not useful for God. And He's going to take you home. You'll be that vessel of dishonor. So I want to make sure you look up here on the screen. And just as a pretext, I know some of this text is small. And I do my best to try and get it all blown up. But if we were to get it blown up big enough, uh, it would be 80-something slides. And it would just be a lot. So bear with me. If you want a copy of this, like in a PDF or something, I'd be more than happy to email it to you. And you can use it for your, uh, for your study there. What is antinomianism? And if I were to categorize this study with one tagline, it'd be this, taking a biblical teaching to an unbiblical conclusion. Well, let's take a look here. What is antinomianism? Let's see it defined. Antinomianism means against the law, against the law. Theologically, antinomianism is the belief that there are no moral laws God expects Christians to obey. The word antinomianism comes from the Greek two words, anti, meaning against, and nomos, meaning law. And if you want an uh, explanation of where that's at, I put the source down there at the bottom. Antinomianism takes a biblical teaching to an unbiblical conclusion. The biblical teaching is that Christians are not required to observe the Old Testament law as a means of salvation. And this is true. What is the purpose of the law? It is supposed to be our tutor, our schoolmaster. It is supposed to be a mirror in which we are exposed to this fact. I do not measure up. I miss the mark. What's the mark? The full following of the law. Can you keep it? The answer is no. And the top 10 that we know are not the only ones, folks. This is why the Pharisees were caught up in self-righteousness and why Jesus called them whited sepulchers. Because on the outside, they had enough of the law kept to deceive other people and themselves, but Jesus, who can see directly to the truth, saw what they really were, a rotting corpse, because they did not keep the law to the fullest. This is why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. For people at that time, that's an impossible thing. If I can't be as righteous as the most righteous ones among among our people, however will I be able to become good enough to get into heaven? You need a replacement. So antinomianism starts with the correct principle. We are not going to do anything of the Old Testament law that will merit our own salvation. Where it continues is here, and we're right here on the slide. When Jesus died on the cross, he fulfilled the Old Testament law. The unbiblical conclusion is that as an extent, there are no more moral laws God expects Christians to obey. So uh, here's a question. Did Jesus fulfill the law on the cross? Well, look at these two verses up here. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So yes, and praise God, yes. He fulfilled all the requirements of the law in which you and I could not fulfill of ourselves. And to the person that believes, your sin is paid forever. Now look at the next verse here. This is in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So Jesus, by dying on that cross, fulfilled the commands and ordinances and made two into one. We are now one with him. The person who believes on Jesus is now a part of his body. And that's final. 
So now from this point on, the first part of our sanctification has been achieved. Please pay attention to me now, because this is where people trip and stumble and skin their little spiritual knees because they're not understanding the full counsel of the Word of God. Our sanctification is in three tenses, past or positional. When you believe, you are now placed in the body of Christ. Ongoing or progressive, which means the battle between our flesh and our spirit is As we yield more to the Spirit and grow, we continue the process of our sanctification. Not as a requirement, but as a part of how we will be rewarded. And then there is the final one, the one that my dear mother has already experienced in that she is absent from that body and she's present with the Lord. That's the ultimate sanctification. What is the difference in each one of those positional places? The first one is we're saved from the penalty of our sin. We can be saved from the power of our sin now, and we will be saved from the presence of our sin, because when I walk into heaven, the old Jesse Edwin Martinez that you know is gone, gone, gone. My body's gone. My flesh nature is gone. All of my wicked, sinful tendencies are removed. Thank God that there's not any part of me, (laughs) my flesh in heaven, you know what I'm saying, or yours. Let's not make this the rag on Jesse's show. I'm going to introduce you to this problem too. I don't want any part of your sin nature there. Otherwise, it's not heaven. To say that there now has to be a misapplication of the entire purpose of the Christian life because of one part of our our sanctification is to err and set people up for failure. Here's what happens. They become the gods of their own lives. I don't feel like doing that. And if you tell me to do it, you're putting me under the law, you legalist. We laugh. But that is, that is happening by good, gospel-rooted people. It's a deception. Phrases surrounding antinomianism. Here's the things that you'll hear. Since I am dead to the flesh and alive in Jesus, there is nothing left for me to obey. I am complete in Him. Well, partially, you sure are complete in him. But what's going to happen at the judgment seat of Christ when you, stay up, when you stand before the Lord and say, well, uh, I just didn't want to be burdened. Yeah, all of that will be burnt up. Any instruction from a spiritual leader which asks me to obey for God's blessing is legalism, and we'll define that. I live my life by grace and not by a set of rules and commandments to keep. Jesus fulfilled all my requirements on the cross. I don't have to do anything else now in order to be Christ-like. Then why in the world would Paul write to Timothy to keep the faith if there wasn't a chance that he could wander away from the truth? Amen? And it can happen. All of my actions are resulting from Christ within me. Therefore, I am always doing what God wants me to do, even in your sin. This kind of teaching, I talked to a pastor this week that said, I asked him, I said, has any of this teaching affected you and your ministry or have you seen it? He said there was a church that supported him and when he found out that the Sunday school teacher, who's an antinomian, had open pornography on his table in his living room, because we're all saved by grace, he had to stop support of that church, stop receiving support of that church. Let me ask you a question. If we're saying that there's no moral laws in which we should follow, why in the world should we be faithful in our marriage then? If everything we do is sanctioned by God, watch out. Watch out for this easy, this, this easy Christian life stuff. We live by grace. Yankee called it Spacey Gracie. And he talked about it in in that it did take, at one point, it took hold at FBC for, for a brief period of time. And there were students who were concerned about whether they should get dressed that morning because they're saying, am I doing that in the flesh or am I doing that in the spirit? And I have no more flesh nature, therefore... You want to talk about not having a burden? Look, folks, when I got up this morning, I put my clothes on and that was it. I didn't think if this was in my flesh or in my spirit, I thought I need to cover up this flesh, Amen get the clothes on. 
And that sounds like a burden to me. Oh, am I doing this in the flesh or in the Spirit? Come on. Stop burdening me with works. Let me live my life without the burdens of your legalism. Antinomianism's <laughs> doctrinal error. It's a lack of knowledge regarding progressive sanctification like we just talked about. Okay? It's a denial of the two natures. A lot of people that believe this believe from Galatians 2.20, which we just read on Sunday night a couple of weeks ago. They say things like this. Because I'm now dead in my flesh, I am alive under Christ. I can only do things through Christ. You can only do things in which will be profitable through Christ. But Galatians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18 has something to say to you. <laughs> Our flesh is not dead. We are to live dead to it. You understand? It's still there. You go out this, today and you get on the street of Hillsborough and go up and down, I'm sure at some point, your flesh will be tested. The driving out there is abysmal. <laughs> and it's also an immature perspective of work and responsibility for the believer. Listen, when I was a kid, the last thing I wanted to do on a Saturday after I did my hour of reading and I earned my unlimited outdoor time, the last thing I wanted to do was mow the grass. And I certainly didn't want to edge. And I certainly didn't want to blow off the sidewalk or go do that for my neighbor. This is my Saturday. And you know what often happened? I did the grass, but I did a poor job. I edged the sidewalk, but I did a poor job. And that I was rewarded as such. But it, what, what, what's, ended up, what's ending up happening is people don't want to do what God says to do and they try to excuse it away as if God will go, oh, I didn't think of that. Okay. What does the Bible say? Study to show thyself, and this is not a part of my point, but this is to back up why we should ask, what does the Bible say? Because we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And that's what a wanna is built off of. All right, here's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall I, or how shall we, that are dead to sin, live any longer therein? Well, the que there's the question. Answer it. That's what I would say to the antinomian who says, it doesn't matter what I do and you can't tell me what to do. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm showing you what God told you to do. And you know what? If you have a clear church in which you can attend and you do not, that's a problem. You're out of line with what God says you're to do. Oh, well, you're burdening me because I have to go somewhere on Sunday. Oh, really? You know, if the Apostle Paul had that attitude, God would have had to find somebody else. He had his head removed from his body for the sake of the gospel. In fact, one of the very first things that Jesus tells Paul is, I'm going to show you how many great things you must suffer for my name's sake. Well, I guess that's what Paul wanted. He was just a glutton for punishment. No, that's how God's going to use him. And he'll use you the same way. But we can find joy in our service because our life is more than just the circumstances. Amen? You have to, we have to be careful of this kind of teaching. 1 John 2, 3 through 6, and this is where it gets a little tight on the font size, so bear with me. And hereby we do know that we are, are and, and, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Yikes. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Again, I'm not going to go on the side street here about this. It's not about losing our salvation because 1 John's not about that. You want the love of God perfected in your life? Do what he says to do. And you will become a powerful vessel for the Lord. But if you're going to do what you want to do, you're the God in your life. And you say you're walking with the Lord, you're, you're a liar. I don't like calling people liars unless I know. But there's a lot of people on the internet right now that are trying to justify this type of behavior, and they're liars. I see how they divide the word, and it's not rightly. You've got to be careful of this stuff, guys. Hereby we know that we are in him. 
He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. You know what a lot of people are doing? They're pulling up that comfortable chair from Office Depot. They're taking a seat. They're plugging in. They're doing all their work and showing people how good they are, and then they don't do anything in the real life. There's a program out there called Second Life, where you can literally create your own world and escape. I've put on those VR headsets, and I'm so much escaped into that that I trip and fall in the living room. (laughs) I can't even use them. (laughs) You can ask my nephews. I can't do it. I put it on for one thing. I did some space golf thing, and I thought I was going to throw up. (laughs) I was totally there. I was in space. (laughs) I was going to (laughs) vomit. Oh, man, I don't know where that was going. So let's just move on to the next slide. 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. They're actually just a few. Love God and love one another. And that just those two can be used in many different ways. Why would we have to be told in Colossians 3 to put off some things and put on other things? So what is legalism? Because many of you may have been called that. I've been called that. You're a legalist. I've been told, you're a legalist because you won't let me have sex before marriage. I'm a legalist? That's what the word says. So what is legalism? Let's see what it is properly defined. Legalism is a doctrinal position emphasizing a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth. Legalists believe in and demand a strict literal adherence to rules and regulations. Doctrinally, it is a position essentially opposed to grace. So a legalist says you're saved by works, you're kept by works. Those who hold a legalist position often fail to see the real purpose for the law, especially the purpose of the Old Testament law, which is to be our schoolmaster and a tutor tutor to bring us to Christ. So this is what legalism is, as defined here. The lordship salvation gospel is legalist. The gospel that says if you don't have X, Y, and Z kind of fruit, then you were never really saved is a legalist gospel. The person who takes rules like don't drink, don't smoke, don't do, you know, you know, keep yourself pure, all that kind of stuff as a requirement to be holy in just action alone is a legalist. How do we become holy? We have a change up here. The renewing of your mind is how we will be rewarded. And that will lead to spiritual discipline. Naturally, if I'm doing the things of God, I'm not going out there and committing fornication, nor am I murdering, nor do I have hate in my heart. And that's a progressive thing. Have you ever forgiven someone and yet you're still angry? I I had to learn that lesson about three or four years ago, and it was hard. Because I had, I had verbally forgiven, but there were still emotions that welled up. You know why it is that way? Because I'm still me. I still have my flesh. I did the right thing spiritually, but my, my, the rest of me had to come along. You understand? So I'm going to ask some questions here and give you some answers, and then we'll close, all right? Question. Is it legalism to say the believers... Uh, excuse me, that should say that to say that believers should have good works? Answer, no. And over here on the right, I'll give you some verses. And again, this gets tight, but just bear with me. This is Titus chapter 3 and verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God, raise your hand if you put your faith in Jesus for your salvation, might be careful to maintain good works. Raise your hand if that applies to you. We need to be careful to maintain good works because it's easy to not keep them. These things are good and profitable unto who, church? Men, lost people, saved people. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The whole point of our salvation is alongside redeeming us from hell, is so that we can learn to have works that are actually good and profitable to the Lord. 
because we are his workmanship. And let us not be weary in what? Leisure? <laughs> I'll say this until, until I die. Leisure is lethal. Be careful if you're living for leisure. It will kill your motivation to serve. If you, don't, if you are protecting your time and you won't even let service and prayer and Bible study get in there, careful. The swift hand of, of God's chastening is coming. He's going to correct you out of his love. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, believers will be rewarded uh, uh, by Jesus according to their works done after their salvation. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Yikes. Bad? Yeah. Unprofitable. Well, you're a legalist. No, I'm a, we're biblicists over here. This is what the Bible says. Um, yes, on that same point, 1 Corinthians 3.13, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Believers still have a flesh nature, and it opposes the spirit nature. This is a part of our ongoing sanctification. I didn't really complete that point there because I didn't have enough space. But when I say this is a part, I don't mean the, the battle. I mean the yielding to our spirit nature and the denial of the flesh is a part of our ongoing sanctification. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying. That's not of Christ. That's not of God. That's of your flesh. You need to learn to say no and say yes to what the Spirit is telling you to do. And it's not some mystical trance in which it lifts you up off your bed and you look like something out of the exorcist. That's not what that is. It is by reading the Word of God and applying it, doing what it says. We are out of time, so please uh, look up here. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Believers are also warned to not lose their steadfastness by succumbing to wicked behavior. Yea, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. That's pretty clear. We're to grow in, in, in grace and not fall away from our own steadfastness by succumbing to the error of the wicked, like antinomianism. It sounds scary, and it should be scary, okay? <laughs> Question, is it backloading the gospel by focusing on good works? The answer is no. Backloading the gospel is making works a necessary part of salvation. It's not wrong for me to stand up here in this pulpit and say, if you do not maintain good works, God will not bless you. That's not wrong. That's Bible. What's wrong is to say, if you don't maintain good works, then you were never saved. That's wrong, because that's not what God says. Encouraging the believer to maintain good works has nothing to do with their salvation. Instead, it focuses on their spiritual growth. I hope this all makes sense to you. And I know this was a very uh, quick study. You can go ahead and turn the lights on for me, Jan, if you don't mind. It's a very quick study, but it is important. And listen, I've had people tell me, he speaks so, I, this is people on the internet and email and stuff, you speak too harshly, you speak too, too uh, boldly, you yell too much. You know what? It's not because I'm angry. It's because I'm confident in what the Scripture says. And folks, I want you to have the same kind of confidence. Because if you're not careful, this is going to gobble you up. And you're going to find a day where you're like, oh, I just can't go to Calvary anymore. They're works-based. And you know what? Shame on the people that take clear teachers and drag them through the mud. The, the mud. It is hard enough to get a clear message out there. I got three emails this week about people saying, thank God that I found a clear gospel. 
You better, we better make sure what we're saying is biblical and accurate. Let the word speak for itself. This is the gospel message. This hand representing you and me and my wallet representing sin. We all have sin on us and this hand representing Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Did you catch that? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the gospel message. And there's a lot of people that teach that doctrine that we just talked about tonight that believe that. And they'll be in heaven. They'll be in heaven. So the, the goal is not to attack the individual. It's to lovingly come alongside and say, hey, let's keep our noses in the Bible and out of our own desires. Okay? And call it what it is. It's a heretical doctrine. And it ought not be taught or supported. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity tonight to get into your word and rightly divide. I pray, Lord, that people can see past me and the way that I talk and the way that I may present things and look to the truth of your word. Lord, we pray for the individuals that are lost in this antinomianism doctrine. We, we, we pray that they would mature and come to the right understanding of what the Bible says. Many of these people have the Holy Spirit in them, but they've just learned to walk in the flesh. Father, I pray for those that may be watching today that have yet to believe on you, that they would do so for salvation. Bring us back here safely for another great Sunday morning and Sunday night. We ask that you give uh, strength to Dr. Arnold uh, for his preaching on Sunday morning, and we're just so thankful, Lord, that we can be able to uh, see people get saved through the ministries here at Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. All right, let's all stand together. By the way, I heard from Larry. He's back home. He's recovering. I don't know when he's planning on being here because he's still getting therapy at home, but just be praying for him. He's, he's on the road, so. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday morning. Take care.